Hello, welcome to Reality TV. I'm Raymond Bakari, and today I'm joined by the state representative for District 8 here in Rhode Island. He had served on the Providence City Council for years in the past, and he was even the acting mayor in between the conviction of uh, then Mayor Buddy Cianci and the election of uh, soon to be mayor uh, at that time, David Cicilline. Uh, that's State Representative John Lombardi. Representative Lombardi, how are you today? How are you, sir? Pleasure I'm, to meet with you today. I'm doing great, and it's good to have you on. Just diving right into it here, just to provide the context for those watching who might not know about your previous venture, uh, previous offices you held before um, State Representative of District 8. You were also a city councilman in the city for uh, for years and even the acting mayor at one point. What are some of the things you missed the most about your time in city government? Well, uh, my my description of being in city government, Mr. Bakari, is very simple. It's like being the head janitor. So... Uh, uh, you know, potholes, trees, garbage, you know, uh, police availability, fire, uh, you know, uh, things, you know, recreation, all things that uh, I've worked with, you know, education. So I'm a qualified school teacher. I'm a qualified principal. Uh, I have a law degree, obviously. Uh, I was director of recreation in Providence. I was a regular city council person. I was the city council president for eight years. As you indicated, I was the uh, mayor of Providence for four months and and a lot of people refer to that as the reign of terror. And um, and uh, then I then I uh, you know went to law school, became a lawyer, uh, and I um, I've been practicing law for about thirty four years. And I'm also a municipal court clerk and pro, uh, a judge of, in the province, uh, as I've been for like six and a half years. And I've been a state rep for going on my night. This will be my tenth year coming up. So yeah, I mean, uh, I've been, uh, I don't have children. I've been married for, you know, since 1992, but uh, as someone indicated, you've been very busy, Mr. Lombardi. You have about 13, 14,000 of them. So you keep forgetting that, but I love, I've lived in this neighborhood for my entire life, 69 years. And uh, I've lived in this neighborhood uh, within a six block radius, probably the entire time. So I am definitely committed to this neighborhood. I have the, as much energy as I did you know, when I first started, because it's a great neighborhood, you know, it went from the Italian American Catholic neighborhood to now I think it, it's a very funky uh, millennial uh, LGBTQ students, you know, uh, some minority represent. So it's it's not the Italo, Italo American Catholic neighborhood that it started off to be, but I love the changes. People are expending their money here. They're buying houses, they're repairing them. And it's a go-to uh, destination, uh, you know, especially Owls Avenue, Broadway, and Westminster Street. We have some of the finest restaurants in the world. I mean, you know, everyone knows about Camille's and and uh, Old Canteen. And then, you know, we have Ogies, we have, you know, uh, Seven Stars, uh, you know, Nick's. I mean, and you know, I can go on and on and on. But as you can tell, I'm very passionate. And, uh, I'm married to this neighborhood, and I do everything in this neighborhood. I wish I could buy a car here. That's the only thing I can do, but my cleaning, my, uh, you know, wash my car. I do everything in this thing. And uh, starting off to the focus now, focusing on a topic that I've covered frequently on the show and usually ask state reps and senators this, it's, it's the idea of term limits for members of the state legislature. It has support from uh, Democrats like yourself, Representative Hall in the last episode said he's in, in favor of it, and even Republicans too, like Bob Catrocci and uh, George Nardone, who's also on the show, talking about it uh, um, uh, a few episodes back. Can you explain for those watching uh, where you stand, I mean, uh, what the benefits uh, could come with the uh, term limits? Yeah, I, I, th this doesn't come in a vacuum, Mr. Bakari. This comes from uh, when uh, when uh, we were in city government and, you know, we saw what happened with the uh, disgraced mayor at the time. And, uh, you know, we convened, we finally got to the uh, Charter Commission to convene and we went from, you know, unlimited ser uh, service uh, uh, in the council and the mayoral seats to three four-year terms for the council, two four-year terms for the for the mayor, which is consistent with the governor, you know, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, secretary of state, and uh, you know, on and on and on. Uh, so, but in, in, so my and since I've been there, and and, it, and by the way, it has withstood uh, constitutional muster. So that's the good thing about it. So since I since I was elected in 2013, I have proposed every single year for term limits, meaning. Uh, so, uh, you know, say if we, they were to pass it now, we would wait, say three years, and then you'd have three, four year terms. Now, you know, uh, let's face it. This is, 
you know, this year was a $13, a $13 billion budget. These seats should really be full-time. They really should. They need to be, full. if we're going to truly pay attention to what needs to be done in this state and neighborhood by neighborhood, area by area, because, you know, what, you know, say, well, you know, what goes on in Boroughville doesn't apply to you. It most certainly does. You know, what goes on in Newport certainly applies, you know, tourism, you know, whatever, you know, clean air, uh, clean water, you know, uh, uh, safe streets. Th this is this is a uh, universal problem. This is not a local problem. And I say three, four year terms, you know, uh, that'll create, that'll cause, uh, create, I think in a good way, new leadership, uh, new, new uh, you know, new ideas. You know, so, well, you know, that'll make the lobbyists and even some of the employees be strong. Well, no, if this is either full-time or, or, or uh, term limited, I think people will not get involved unless they truly want to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Look, as you know, it's, it's, it's okay to, you know, question conventional wisdom and, you know, challenge the status quo. I think it's always worked for me. Uh, uh, everyone worked against me from, to be council president. I ended up being the council president for eight years. I, I think, you know, we had, as the council president, we had the very first black woman in the history of province to become the council president pro tem. The very first Latino in the history of province to be the majority leader. We had the very first black EEO officer. We had the very first black uh, human relations uh, a person, Sybil Bailey. And I, and I could, you know, this is, this is about understanding, reading what's going on. Providence is a minority majority city with very, you know, we have in the schools, we have 52 different languages that are spoken in the Providence school system. And this, but this doesn't only apply in Providence, this is a statewide issue. So for example, why isn't there other than one person of, of, of uh, Asian, of Asian extraction elected to city, uh, uh, to a government, a governmental uh, seat, whether it be state rep, state, this, I believe only one council person in Portsmouth. You know, we're talking about seven, eight percent of the population in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, again, a province in business that I could talk at nauseam about, I mean, Providence has, it's a minority majority city. Uh, I'm glad that there's going to be seven or eight people that are term limited. I think you're going to get a diverse population, a different leadership. That's I'm very excited about it. I really am. And I think we should all be because I, I, again, I think everything will be on the table and uh, we can get some, I think, incredible discussion on, uh, you know, how money should be expended, you know, for things like recreation. Look, as you know, as we all know, let, let's be honest, social service programs. Do people think that because a social service program shuts down at five o'clock on a Friday, that there's no problem from five o'clock on a Friday to Monday morning at nine o'clock? You're living in a fantasy world, whoever thinks that. We, those programs need to be extended. We need to extend recreational programs. It, it shouldn't be shutting down. The pools, for example, the problem shouldn't be shutting down five, six o'clock. It's warm at night. I mean, you just see what's been going on the last two weeks. And again, uh, so, so right now, something that I'm working on, there are, there's a group of about six to 15 people of color, young, uh, young men and women of color that are looking for an Olympic size pool to swim in, to practice. Now, when I say this, several of them, believe it or not, have a good shot to become Olympians. Guess what? They can't find a forum or, 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 or an arena to, to practice. We've reached out to Brown University. So, you know, the, the only other place is McDermott and Warwick. So again, as you, I, my point of this is in addition to, you know, meeting that need, it's not a Providence issue. This is a statewide issue. So I say, step up people. Let's do what we have to do for the, those children that, you know, ordinarily some of those kids may be doing something else. They want to provide, they want to offer, they want to hone their skills so they can be doing something that's maybe unbelievable, including but not limited to being watched by the entire pro, uh, population of this world to excel in whatever they may be excelling in. That's to me is very special. That's very special.
And you had uh, mentioned that those are quite a lot of uh, benefits that could uh, come with uh, term limits for members of, members of the state legislature. And a number of politicians that um, are in favor of term limits that don't necessarily um, get it passed, what they do is sometimes they self-term limit themselves. Like we've seen this with Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania, who uh, pledged to only do two U.S. Senate terms. He's now retiring ahead of the 2022 election. And you've been an elected state representative since uh, 2012, like you had mentioned, which is uh, four terms uh, total. And if you're reelected, depending on your 2022 plans, that would be term number five. And I've heard of um, like, you know, like four terms uh, Rep Nardone had proposed on the show. I think seven was proposed by Rep Hull. Since it doesn't seem likely to pass, do you have a set number of terms that you would serve uh, before deciding not to run for re-election and sort of like lead by example? on this yeah absolutely uh again and you know i i left you know when it was time to leave i left the city council so yes i do uh and again you know my thinking is four three-year terms that would be my ideal it may end up being six two-year terms but yes i mean i would probably you know not serve more than maybe one two more terms yeah and uh, now shifting to some of the issues facing Providence, since your district is in Providence, uh, one of the biggest issues in, in uh, the recent weeks has been, you know, the spikes in crime. And in the discussions of in the discussions of addressing the recent spikes in crime, you have those who say we need to address the root causes of crime, like housing and job programs. Some say that we need to defund the police. And what they what some mean by that is uh, having some of the money allocated to programs to have mental health workers address uh, mental health crises. While others say that the police department needs to be strengthened, and for those calls to defund them to stop. In your opinion, what needs to be done to stop these spikes in crimes and ensure the residents in the city can feel safe? All of the above. Uh, amen to what you just said. Uh, you, you, you articulated it with, with, with precision. Uh, yeah, I, we could find over $2 million, right? I mean, I can. I mean, the budget is, you know, 400, 570 million. Uh, the police budget is like, you know, 96, 97 million. Uh, we could find two point two million dollars right in the commissioner's office. I say, you know, eliminate that uh, and put that into social service programs, police athletic leagues, you know, something that we haven't seen. Let people know that the, the cops are, I mean, you know, not every cop is a bad cop. You know, we need to have sensitivity training. Uh, you know, we need to, we need to be able to train, reach, and one of the things I've been proposing since I've been there, another thing in the state level is, is train every single police department to recognize the difference between someone who's just, uh, you know, being a knucklehead, if I may, or someone who has a disability. And, you know, it may not necessarily be that someone may be learning. What about if someone's a diabetic? Now I'm a diabetic. So I, you know, I know some of the things, sometimes you get a little confused. So, you know, you need to maintain, you know, your, your, your sugar at a, at a certain level. So, and, you know, and, that doesn't mean that I'm a, a, you know, a mean person or a killer or anything like that. So, you know, I want to be treated accordingly to say, oh, buddy, you okay? You know, can I get you an orange juice? Not, you know, beat up and kicked in the head, certainly. But uh, uh, no, I, I mean, you know, when you speak to people, no, they don't want to defund, meaning eliminate the police. That, that's not what I'm hearing. It's everything that you said. Uh, but again, increase social service programs, increase recreation. We need more police officers on the street. You know, but we need them to be uh, community police officers, truly community. So, mean, we need to start hiring. Uh, the police force should represent the population of the city of Providence. And oh, by the way, Mr. Bakari, Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Jones, Miss Smith, whatever. Don't when you like to have a police officer or a fire person uh, or whatever living next to you. So that residency rule was a bad thing to eliminate. And maybe going forward, we need to make sure that they commit the five to 10 years of living in the city. Because that, look, there are plenty of ch uh, young men and women that would qualify to be police. No, that qualify to be police. Now, something you may not know, maybe your listeners don't know. Now, what, would, what is one of the easiest ways to eliminate someone as a potential candidate for public safety? And everyone says, well, their criminal background. And believe it or not, that's that's minor because we do have police officers that have had some things in their past. The best way to do it is you look at and remember you're looking to eliminate people. And I always say about elected officials and politicians and the people that do the governance, if you want to uh, not do something, you can always find a reason. And you know how you find the reason? You look at their credit background. And and the thinking is well, if this person can't pay their rent 
or you had a car repossessed or whatever, uh, they're not good enough to be a public, serv- a, a public safety person. Now, let me ask you a question. Who do you know doesn't have a bill? And you don't have to answer that question because I know you know the answer is almost everyone you know, probably. <laughs> so it's just, it, you know, it, it can't always be, you know, someone's relative. I, I recall when I was the council president and there were six or eight new offices and uh, Colonel Esselman was the chief of the thing and I was the council president. There were six or eight new offices that were living in a one family house in Mount Pleasant. Every single one of them signed an affidavit on the penalty of perjury that they would move into that house within six months. Every single phone number area code was either 617 or 508. Now, let me ask, let's be very candid about this. Do you think any of them ever moved into Providence? That's all I'm going to say. (laughs) What's your next question, sir? <laughs> and you, you kind of touched upon what was in my uh, follow up because you, you, it sounds like, is it fair to say you're like in favor of a healthy balance in the middle of like, you know, the police reform, community policing, but still finding some money for those uh, programs? Absolutely. No doubt about it. And I think you can. I, I, again, I just found you two million change if you and, want to eliminate uh, the public safety commissioner. And uh, looking at the follow, like a, a follow-up that I had uh, wanted to ask, because you kind of touched upon how you said you're not like in favor of abolishing the pol- to abolishing yeah. the police or like straight out just defunding them just to defund them. Uh, what are your thoughts on that rhetoric? Because there are some uh, lawmakers in the state senate. One of them in particular had said on Twitter, "It's not time to defund, but abolish." I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think you know, look, as an officer of the court, uh, as as a judge. Having worked, with, and by the way, I was probably arrested more times than I care to admit as a young man. And I know what it is, you know, to get arrested just because I was Italo American. We didn't speak English in my house. You know, we lived on Federal Hill. Right one time I got arrested for wearing sunglasses at night and there were prescriptions. Uh, so I totally get it. And that's why I'm, that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons in chief that I'm an attorney. I do, you know, quite a bit of criminal work, and I, you know, I'm one of the, I'm one of the lawyers in the, uh, in the queue for uh, BLM, so I get it all, I get it all, but, uh, I, you know, when your back is up against the wall, and you, you, you know, I mean, we had two more murders last night in Providence. We had, uh, I know because there was a young lady assaulted at a night, coming out of a nightclub last night. She has, she thinks they, she may have some brain damage or. Uh, the family called me and uh, and all she was was leaving the club. A fight broke out and uh, I don't even know if the police know about it yet, but uh, I'm sure I'm going to be talking to the colonel about it. I mean, who's going to go do it? What are you going to go get gangs to do it? You're going to, you know, you're going to go get, you know, uh, vigilantes to do it. Somebody has to do this stuff and somebody has to uh, maintain the, uh, the uh, civil obedience and the decorum that is required to make this city a great city that we are. We have so much going for us and it may sound corny, but man, I mean, we walk on the East side, uh, a friend of mine and and another lawyer, I said, we we solve all the problems in the world. You know, you walk into a Fox Point, you walk into East side proper. Then I come to Federal Hill with, you know, it's historical district right here where my law office is. And it's, it's like, man, you know, this is great stuff. This is good stuff, and uh, uh, we have to stop promoting this in a positive way, but we need to let people know that they're safe. We need to have state-of-the-art schools. Look, it's, it's, it's unfair. Uh, so I was, and again, I can give you, you know, uh, all these uh, tidbits, but Gilbert Stewart School, which is, you know, right here on Buckwood Street. I was there maybe four or five years ago, Christmas time, and I'm on the stage with uh, then uh, Councilman Wilbur Jennings, who's a you know a black man married to a Latina. And we're standing on the stage and he's looking around and I said, what's the matter, Councilman? He says, he said, boy, this is the same stuff that was here when I was here. 1959. 1959. So every kid should have access to a smart board. Every kid should have access to a computer and every teacher should have that. They shouldn't be in roach infested lead asbestos buildings. This, this, should, this should all be resolved. You know, and, and I said this when you know, uh, uh, 
then Governor Raimondo, you know, proposed the, you know, the billion dollars for schools over 10 years. I said, <laughs> I said, it's not enough. And someone, someone asked me, I said, why? I said, Providence alone needs a billion dollars. And we can't wait. We cannot wait. As, as you know, I mean, look, we're on Zoom. Five years when somebody said Zoom, yes, yeah, Zoom, you, you must be crazy. What's a Zoom, you know? They would have thought it was the raw of a jet engine or something. But here we are on Zoom. Our whole life has been about this about the last year and a half, two years. Uh, I mean, if you would ask me two years ago, you're going to be in Zoom conferences and Zoom meetings, I would have said, you know, you've been drinking too much. I'm going to take you to Butler. That's what I would have said. But here we are. We're on a Saturday afternoon. You have direct access to me. You know, you, you know, you, you, there's going to be a publication, whatever. And I want people to hear this. All our children should be given the same amount, the equal amount. It shouldn't be one neighborhood against another. And, and, and that's, you know, it's the battle to me. I really think someone's calculating the votes and saying, okay, that those areas vote 60%. The other areas are voting 10%. They need a school. They need a new school in that area like they need blood. But you know what? We're going to give it to a different area. It's not fair. It's not right. And I really wish at some point someone would sue. And really, let's, let's really talk about uh, uh, equity and fair, fundamental fairness and, you know, what, what really should be happening. And that's in my opinion. Because you know what? All our children can learn. Our kids are pretty smart. Our kids are pretty smart. Now, I don't have children. But some of the kids that I deal with, uh, like, uh, you know, my legal assistant's daughter, two daughters, one of them's 20 years old. She's a Quinnipiac. She's got, she's started her master's program like last semester. This kid, and this kid wants to be a doctor. I mean, that's amazing to me. <laughs> you know, uh, let's talk about David Duke, the basketball player. I mean, no one knows where that kid learned how to play basketball. Well, guess where he did? A couple of blocks over at Zuccolo Recreation Center. Those are the role models we're going to have. You know, Bubu Andre, world champion. Okay, world champion boxer. Welterweight. You don't hear about him. We got Mike Stevens, black, one of the best referee, college referee in, in the country, Buckland Street. Family of nine, two of them died in a fire, no fire, no father. The mother raised seven children with, with diabetes. What about the coach of PC? Ed Cooley. Another kid grew up by committee on the south side. Those we've got the role models. These are all people of color. Let's promote them. Guess what? Let's get their ideas and say, look, you did it. How are we going to do this? That's just my humble opinion. Here, you got Cedric Hundley, the head of the Nonviolence Institute. Great athlete, played ball with him, know him very well. You got Dawn Huntley, an attorney from the streets. Let's do what we got to do. There's plenty of people out there that are role models. So let's 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 bring them in. Let's utilize their ideas and their thoughts. And uh, now looking at a statewide issue that does affect Providence uh, residents, given how this tax seems unnecessary, which is the, the car tax, we're heading towards the end of the phase out where I believe we're currently in the, we're going to be in the last year that uh, phase out uh, from the proposed plan from Speaker Mattiello. Uh, where do you stand on finally getting rid of the car tax once and for all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the, the, the bulk of the cars, you know, they make, well, well, you know, those cars are worth, you know, $5,000, you know, whatever, but, but, those extra few dollars, as you know, means putting food on the table. I mean, it, it, look, in Oneyville, it's one of the poorest sections in, in the state. It was, it's one of the most highly uh, contagious areas for COVID, mainly people of color, especially from the Latino community, uh, Latinx, I'm sorry. Uh, so why, why wouldn't we want to put an extra $20 a month in their pocket Whatever it may be. I mean, you know, the, the number may seem de minimis to most people, but they're not. It means a lot. It's about feeding your family. It's about keeping a roof over you. I mean, the basic, you know, heating, you know, whatever, uh, keeping a, 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 a safe shelter for your family. So, yeah, I say yes. Yeah, I definitely support it and I want it done. And looking at another controversial vehicle related issue, you know, we're it looks like the truck tolls, they're going to be happening. The speaker on the show, he said that we're not going to do it for cars, but 
he did say, however, that the only way the car tolls could, like the extension to the, the tolls of cars could happen is if the House, Senate, and governor agree on it. So he's basically saying it's unlikely and not on his radar, but still technically a possibility. And that would also affect Providence residents if it went to, to cars. You're already seeing that the gantry's coming up and whatnot. So just, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it sounds like you'd probably be against the, the car tolls too, but is that fair to say you'd be against car, the extension of car tolls? Uh, absolutely. But again, what we were promised, I mean, look, it, it's not to add out of an item. You know, look, you know, different leadership, we've got a different speaker, you know, we're gonna have, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, uh, you know, we have a new chair of finance. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that was the commitment. That's the way the documents that I read, and I will fight till the end to make sure that doesn't happen. Now, are there any guarantees? Uh, you know, I mean, no one's asking. I mean, I'm not sitting, I'm not being asked to huddle up in a room to say, you know, a smoke filled room to say, okay, uh, what are we gonna do with this for that? No, but uh, I, I think. I think that's pretty unanimous that uh, most most of my colleagues, unless they're uh, double speaking, uh, they do not support it. And I, to answer your question, I will fight tooth and nail to make sure that doesn't happen. And now circling back to Providence issues, uh, you know, a big one is the city's pension system. I brought this up multiple times with 2022 mayoral candidates, you know, potential and ones that have declared already, uh, you know, given that you have a lot of experience in city government, you know, being acting mayor at one point, being council president, how do you think the city's, pen the city's pension system should be addressed? I mean, could be addressed. Well, it, it, look, it, it's, it's an adjunct failure. It's, it's abysmal, uh, you know, and, you know, with the, uh, with the Google, uh, 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 we, 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 we blew a golden opportunity with the Google case. Now, North Providence bailed their pension system over there. They, they received $60 million. Now, why, why, we were not, uh, why we were not part of that? <laughs> we were a city state, the capital city. For some reason, they pulled our offices out of that. That would have been a nice $60 million that you know, we could have utilized to offset some of this. Uh, you know, going forward, we need to make sure that people contribute more. They have to work uh, long. Look, people are living longer. They can work longer. I mean, they did it with the police. I mean, when, when I left, it was 60. Now I think they can stay until they're 65. Now, I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, you know, I'm a little older than that. I don't think I'd be chasing down any, <laughs> any perpetrators at 65 years old. I don't think that's going to happen with me, but uh, I'm sure there are some guys that do it, but... Uh, I, I think if you do that, I think, you know, maybe we need to do some kind of a hybrid, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of a hybrid system. Uh, maybe maybe we should turn it over to the state. I mean, there's lots of things that I think we have to um, look at. I think everything should be on the table. You know, somebody else said that. I don't want to take credit for that. I used to say it before. You know, you know, one of the things we may have to think about doing is why aren't we regionalizing the schools in the state of Rhode Island? Okay, let, let's put it on the state. You have 39 cities and towns. Why can't we do five? Why can't we do six? I mean, do we need all these superintendents and deputy superintendents and lawyers and school committees and, and all that stuff? I, look, I know no one wants to let go of their fiefdoms. I get that. But if we're gonna if we wanna save this and wanna do, you know, think outside the box, I think that's the way they're gonna have to do it. I mean, look, look, with the advent of again. The computers here we are zooming are we going to need as many employees going down the line i don't want to i don't want to knock anybody out of a job now i think we need more jobs but uh i think we got to get creative i think we need more public private partnerships i think that's another thing that we have to do uh uh and i mean but everything has to be in the table everything and you know uh, you know maybe we should do our purchases and our say our health benefits do it as a region. Why can't we do a Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire? Why can't we do it that way? Why can't we, uh, you know, purchase our heating fuel that way? I say, let's put it all on the line. Let's do what we have to do.
And when looking at the city's financial situation, like the pension system, you know, the, this, this is all, you know, based on the financial situation and, you know, getting the money for this. And one, uh, one topic that I frequently cover, like right after talking about the pension system is, you know, making these institutions like Brown University and Providence College pay their fair share since, you know, they owned up, own up to, I think it's 40% of the land in the city, but, you know, they don't have a taxable status. And I've heard multiple answers in regards to this topic that I frequently covered on how they could finally be, you know, pushed to pay their fair share. One instance was when Councilman Salvatore said if the state would let the city tax these institutions, it could happen. Given that you're in the state house currently and served on the council and would, you know, know the how this how that could happen or if it could even happen, what would be the state's role in that process? It's very simple. Put it put it on, put it before us and we'll vote on it. I mean, I certainly support that. It, you know, it may be more like almost 50% of the property, but uh, there's no reason why property or, or, or buildings or whatever are taken off the payroll when they give it to the tax exempt institute. So anything that's money generating should be taxed like everybody else's. So, you know, a bookstore, you know, uh, uh, whatever, whatever they're deriving money, you know, if it's a bar or restaurant, you know, a training area, whatever, it, it needs to be taxed, according, you know, commensurate with all other businesses. Okay. The other thing is we need to make the legal challenge. You know, this uh, uh, then Mayor Cicilline uh, made a 50 year agreement, you know, whatever to, to get, you know, whatever money's on $50 million. Well, I mean, that's chump change in 50 years or 30 years, whatever it was, but it's chump change. Um, uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor uh, Tavares, you know, gave them more streets. That's like the last thing you want to do with the tax exempt institution. But also, the critical piece in this is it's not only about the colleges or the institutes of higher learning. Then you're going to think about the hospitals and the, uh, the, the places of worship. I mean, you just can't tax one and not the other because they're all tax exempt. So, and that's the critical piece, and that's where, and that's where the uh, state reps and senators would start to have, um, uh, let me see, I'm gonna try to put this in a nice way. They will have um, uh, gurgly stomachs where, uh, they, you know, they may be running to the uh, men's room or the ladies room. Because who wants to tax your church? Who wants to tax your synagogue? Who wants to tax, you know, your place of worship? Do you wanna tax, them? but listen, if you want to truly save this city, this is the way. Or you know what? Do another thing. We've got 100. So let's take Providence again. We have, have 115 parks in the city of Providence. Give them to the schools. Say, yeah, you maintain them. What's the budget for that? 15 million? Maintain it. But you have to hire the kids from Providence. Again, all Warwick, all uh, Central Falls or Pawtucket or Woonsocket. The thing that's most fr frustrating though, Mr. Bakari, is very simple to me. What I don't understand is like similar cities and towns, for example, Providence, Central Falls, Pawtucket, Woonsocket, parts of West Warwick, parts of Cranston. I don't know why we don't work collectively or together because we have the similar problems. We have the homelessness. We have the lack of social service programs. We don't have extended, uh, uh, extensive uh, uh, recreational programs. We have, we have the most people with uh, disabilities, the people with, you know, uh, 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 drug, alcohol related issues, you know, uh, 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 social problems. We should be working more collaboratively. And I think of, so Providence, for example, has 14 state representatives. I mean, we're going to get to the number 75. If we got, I must strike that. We're going to get to the number 38, half. I think we can do it, but we've got to make a, a commitment socially, morally, ethically to say, okay, and legally. The, this is what's most important to talk about the things, you know, you've asked me about social service programs, education, you know, uh, public safety. We've got to commit to that, but we're gonna. We can't just talk it. We can't just speak it. We can't just articulate it. You know what I say? Uh, let's speak softly and carry a big stick. You know, from Buford Pusser, walking tall. And I say, 
That's the way to do it. Let's do it with our actions, not our words. And just kind of circling back to what you touched upon towards the beginning. So is that that's the case? Like if the, the, the a bill were to be passed and signed into law, like these institutions like the hospitals and Brown could finally be taxed and pay their fair oh, share? I'm sure they're going to challenge it. You know, like one of the things with Brown, for example, you know, it's the King James uh, or whatever. You know, we may have to hire an international lawyer. You know, it, it, you know, does this have to be tried at the Hague or, you know, internationally? You know what? If this is what you want to do, let's get the answer. You know what? We may lose. But, you know, you know, you challenge me to a fight every day, you know, so there's going to be a day where I'm going to go, you know what, Mr. Bakari? Okay, let's do it. You know, you may, you may, you may kick my butt, but you're going to know you're in a fight. And guess what? You're never going to bother me again. And, you know, look, look let's, and we're just going to talk about Brown and not that I'm picking up. If they have a 3.2 billion, would it be, endowment, 10% of that is what? 320 million. That loan could save the pension system. Well, I'm not done yet. Uh, no, I, I want to be, what's 1%, 32 million? What's, you know, 10% of that is 3.2 million. Can you commit that to us every year? And by the way, We'll put it towards recreation. You free that money up. You free that money up. You can start paying off the pensions or your social service programs or whatever. Training for the police, training for public safety. There's a way of doing this. But we got to look, it's people like yourself with the creative minds that can do this. Like, you know, people, oh, you know, he's a, he's a naysayer. Lombardi's a naysay. He's always, no, no. I like to question things. I always say there's an easier way, a better way, and a fairer way. But people don't like to talk the way I speak because they're afraid of, you know, hurting feelings. Well, this isn't about hurting feelings. This is about doing the right thing and what's good for everybody. I don't own this. The taxpayers own this. We don't own the General Assembly. The taxpayers own that. The voters own that. Everyone in the state of Rhode Island has, a, has an investment in that. And if we make the wrong investments, everybody loses. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's too creative. Maybe it's pie has, in the sky. Has it, just because so, uh, since you had kind of assured that, uh, has it been introduced in the house or have you made any plans of introducing that? Uh, well, there, there, there's people that have talked about it, but, you know, every, like we had a big, big fight this year about La Salle, if you recall. You know, it was like everybody is, I mean, let's talk about fans. Everybody is tax exempt. That's a school, isn't it? They, so if everybody is tax exempt, how are you going to say to them no? How are you going to win that fight? You're going to be consistent. You know, now, you know, whether you like, you support it, didn't like it, but I, this, I swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States the laws of the state of Rhode Island and the local ordinances. Well, that's the law. We, you, the only way to do it, you change the law. Either we amend it or you get a court case to amend it. That's the only way. There's no other way. So I can tell you this here. If someone puts that in, I will support it a thousand percent. And now shifting the focus for those watching, we've been mainly talking about Providence issues. That's not an accident because there's a mayoral election coming up in 2022. Rep Lombardi, you, I know you ran for mayor in uh, 2002 and 2010, I believe. Uh, once. Oh, yeah, 2010. And um, you, your name has been speculated to run for potentially mayor in 2022. I remember even in 2018, there was hypothetical polling and your name was in there. Um, just going out on a limb here, are you running for mayor in 2022? Well... I've had quite a few, to be honest with you, I've had quite a few people uh, ask me. Uh, I never shut the door on anything. Uh, uh, but I also said, I also indicated if you want guys, if you ladies and gentlemen want to raise the money, I'm certainly ready to do it. Uh, I will walk door to door like I did in 2010. I think I can certainly articulate the issues. I, I live them every day like everybody else. Uh, so I, I would do it in a New York second. But, uh, you know, again, this city is changing and, um, you know, there's several candidates. I mean, I've heard at least 10 names so far. So 
but let, you know, let it be, let it be. That's what I say. It is what it is. So I, I can't say no and I can't say yes. And I, that may sound like a Weasley answer, but uh, it just things are changing so rapidly. And I think if we continue on this, you know, murder every night, two murders, a stabbing, a, you know, a rape. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, the mayor has been absent in all this. I mean, he and the commissioners should be out there assuring people that we're safe. I mean, you know, I, let's, look, we're losing business on Federal Hill. There's no doubt about it. You know, we're losing business and people are going out of the city. They feel safer. And uh, we, we need to change that dynamic. We need to change that paradigm. And the way we do it is by being constructive and saying, hey, look, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. We have great things here in the city of Providence. Let's accentuate those. But let people feel safe. Let their children feel safe in the schools. Let people feel safe if they're going to go to PPAC or Trinity or something like that. You know, we should have learned that from COVID. That sort of sounds like a policy section for a 2022 uh, campaign website. So it sounds like you're uh, not ruling it out. So would you have a, do you have a specific time frame in mind before you'd ultimately have to make the decision of either running or sitting this one out? Well, I, I think that the good thing about it is I do have some recognition, obviously. So I'm not starting from ground zero like some of the some of the other people are. Uh, I do have a citywide, uh, you know, uh, support system if I need it. Again, I've had several people from, you know, all what you know, some of the the old time pals, people from the gay community, the millennials, uh, you know, the progressive community, uh, you know, elected officials, business people, and only reason why is because they know. I'm a decision maker. I, you know, when I when I took over the mayor's seat, I fired 56 people. I didn't need I didn't need ladies to hold an umbrella for me coming out of a car. I think that's wrong in more ways than one. You know what I mean? First of all, why would I do that? I can hold my own umbrella. Those monies could be put towards something else, you know? And you know, we essentially went whereas, you know, not a knock to anybody, but you know, in that mayor's office had. 56 people working. We did it with like 26. Uh, the internal auditor at the time, I said, I said, uh, Jim, I said, do me a favor. I said, I've been here for four months. Tell me how much we would have saved. So that budget was like a $2.1 million. I would have saved one, uh, I would have expended only 1.4 million. And that's the way you do it. You do it by example. You don't need people, you know, getting you water, uh, you, you do that yourself. You lead by example, hard work, determination. I mean, that's what got me to the dance. I did it with no parents. This is, I worked through jobs and I went to college. That's the example we're gonna set. So uh, no, I'm not gonna close the door, but you know, the likelihood of it happening, probably more or less than more. Could you see like maybe by January, 2022, you ultimately making that decision? Uh, yeah, it could be way before, hey, look, there may be somebody that emerges that's going to wow me. And am I being romanced? Yes. I mean, I've met with, you know, most of the candidates. Okay. And I've met with some of them, you know, two and three times. I like a lot of them, uh, you know, and they're okay. I just wish that they would be more outspoken, outspoken on these issues. Uh, it's just, it's scary. It's just scary. Again, two more murders last night. So if it's not you who runs for mayor, do you have anybody in mind that you'd support? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm open. Right now, I'm open because I, I don't think we've seen all the candidates, to be quite frank with you. And I don't want to close the door. I don't want to close the door. Uh, and, and besides, then if I run, suppose one of my relatives runs. I mean, not saying that you don't know. It, does a business person emerge? You know, is there going to be another another woman running? Uh, you know, I, we only have one so far. Is there going to be another lady running? I don't know. Is someone from the LGBTQ going to run that community? I don't know. I don't know. You know, other than, you know, other than, uh, you know, Brett Smiley, I'm saying, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, I have a lot of friends uh, that are involved in politics. Uh, it's just, you know, like I said, there's about 10 names that I've heard. We've probably had like nine of them, including yourself. Well, I'm, Certainly, I'm one of the names too, but yeah, but and I know all of them. 
And uh, now shifting to the to the non-political topics for my uh, last two, you had attended uh, Rhode Island College and I believe earned a, it was a Master of Arts in Education, right? Uh, uh, master's in Education, uh, uh, school principal, yes. Master's in Education. Uh, this is a question I'd like to ask to every Rick alumni because I currently attend Rhode Island College myself. What was your time like as a Rick student? Is there anything you missed the most about it? Well, yeah. Well, for me, again, not having parents, not, had, not having... Uh, anyone who had gone to college, you know, so in my family, if you went to college, you were considered lazy. I worked three jobs and I went to college. So that was being considered because my family was construction and jewelry, jewelry shops. Uh, but my mom and dad worked there in jewelry shops. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, one of the first classes I had was a social a sociology class. And I'll never forget, there was 20 people. There was uh, Dr. Rollins. Uh, uh, I forget exactly what the cost was, but there was 20 people, 19 ladies and one goof. And uh, we sat in a circle and we were going around, you know, where you were from and, you know, this. And then when I said myself and where I was from, and they were asking questions like, is that the place where they have guns hanging out the windows? I mean, it was like, it was like, oh man, this is a different world. <laughs> but uh, for me, it, it really made me, uh, understand and appreciate the different walks of life you know where you know you know people walk in different shoes di different socioeconomic backgrounds you know different uh uh you know people had parents i didn't have parents so you know i mean it was like wow and uh it, it, and i met a lot of great people you know people later on became judges and principals and superintendents and school teachers and politicians and uh, from all walks of life from, you know, different states. Um, and uh, so for me, for me, it was like, wow, what an accomplishment this is. I don't, you know, uh, knowing how to fight or play baseball or basketball or football, you know, it was more than that. It was like, you can actually gain respect by being intellectually, uh, you know, uh, uh, adept, you know what I mean? And, and that's, for me, it was like, wow. So that then I got my matter of fact I went I got my master's uh, Senator Metz and my son Harold Metz we went to school together I mean we we had known each other we had played ball against one on the basketball and stuff but uh, and he and I are still great friends today he can call me anytime um, you know but then I the only thing they didn't do Rick was at that time was to, there was a glut of teachers they probably should have told us you know you may want to think about venturing out and, and I met with the president of Rick not too long ago and I didn't realize all the other areas that they're uh, you know very efficient in and you know way they're trained and I like that better uh I mean it there was just no jobs available for guys like like us you know and some of us had to go you know do other things but you know I my thing was always I enjoyed helping people and I was always backing people and standing up like I was the guy in the schoolyard I wasn't bullying I was getting in the way of the bully like in other words, you got a problem with him, you got a problem with me. You got a problem with him, you got a problem with me. Because you know, I was an angry kid growing up. You know, again, I, I was like a, a mama's boy, you know, by a bespect, a bespectacled, uh, you know, individual who, you know, was like kind of goofy, like, but was a nerd. And then uh, when when my father told me that my mom was dying of ovarian cancer, and I was about twelve, and then she died when I was thirteen, uh, I got very angry. I got very very angry, but I learned how to fight. I mean, it got, me, it got me in trouble, got me arrested, but I learned how to fight. And then what I did was I turned that physical anger into fighting on behalf of people. So uh, I'm always, uh, I always run towards the underdog. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's me. That, that's, that's my, uh, that's what I care about. But a lot of people don't know that. The other thing a lot of people don't know about me, I'm very shy. A lot of people don't know that. But that's 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 the truth. But no, but Rick, Rick, Rick plays a very important role, not only in Providence. I think you want to stay in Rhode Island. I think it's a crown jewel. And I think that it's the it's a it's a diamond in the rough, because just think, what is that education? there? about 40,000 for four years or 50,000 for four it's years? It's about 40, like 10 grand each year if you're uh, commuting. OK, where are you going to get that? That's that's one year. Most colleges. And you know what? I think you can do okay with that. And I'm an example. I mean, I think when I went, I think my entire four-year education was like 3,800, 4,800. I mean, think about that. 
So I think it's a diamond in the rough. I think it's more than a diamond in the rough, but people that don't know, they think, well, Providence. Uh, no, it's, uh, I think, uh, I think Rhode, Rhode Island College, and I told the president this, I think you guys, Rhode Island College needs to let people know exactly what they're doing, because you know what? I don't think there's five people that know what you're doing, and especially up at the state house. Uh, you know, I, I think you guys do so much more than what people even know. But you got to blow your own horn, especially in this, uh, this day and age. Uh, just uh, shifting to my final question, one that I ask everyone here on the show to keep tradition, and that is, in your opinion, what do you think Rhode Island is best known for? See, I'm not the, I, I think it's known for so many good things, but uh, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a vacation, uh, it's a vacation uh, in a heritage uh, loc uh, destination. That's what I think it is. I mean, the beaches are like well known all over the country, maybe the world. I tell you the restaurants, not your teeth out. I mean, I've traveled different countries all over this country, California, you know, I mean, I've been, if they start talking about, you know, restaurants in my neighborhood, Camille's, Old Canty, it was funny, I was, uh, I was at a convention in Las Vegas, and these four people were talking about, I wasn't with them, they're talking about Camille's and Old Canteen, and there was a lot of misinformation, so me, like I always do, I had to stick my nose, and I said, well, I'm sorry, I live about four blocks from them, and uh, this is exactly what it is, so, yeah, I mean, look, the theaters, the institutes of high, I mean, Rick Brown, RISD, and I do, I put Rick right in there with it. You know, PC, Salva Regina, the beaches, the restaurants, the theaters, I mean, the, the historical uh, ambiance and significance of, you know, College Hill, Federal Hill, and, you know, on and on and on. We need to be promoting this. We need to let people know that this is like, this is an oasis. This is uh, this is uh, Eden. This, I mean, it really, you know, it may sound corny, but I really think we do. We got to get these infrastructure repairs done. We got to, you know, clean up our streets, get rid of the graffiti, you know, educate our kids, make make, make people feel safe, you know, uh, co-equal all our all our schools, no matter which city or town they're in. Make it very predictable uh, and uh, by the book. Uh, and open and obvious. I think if we can do that, I think people will be flocking here. I mean, like just my neighborhood alone, Federal Hill, the houses are going for like crazy money, six, seven hundred thousand, a million dollars. These are houses that were purchased for 20, 30, 40,000. The rents have gone from 600 to 3,000 a month. It's going to tell you something. And, you know, is it sustainable? Well, it could be but we need to make our schools, people want to put their kids in our public schools. We need to make people feel safe. They want to be able to go out at night and walk the streets and you know, spend their capital, uh, spend their, their, their liquid. Uh, they want to see a nice show, a nice theater. I mean, uh, Columbus Theater is doing, uh, did something on um, Lovecraft. And I was telling uh, Tom that runs it, I said, this is great. I said, I hope you do something for Halloween. I said. I wish you would play the old horror movies. You know, The Mummy, Frankenstein, Dracula, the Werewolf, Invisible Man. He said, well, I said, are you kidding? Those are the best horror movies ever. Come on, they, they did all that with, with no, uh, no special effects. I said, yes. I said, you know, people, people flock to that stuff. But to answer your question, I think, I think Rhode Island has all those attributes and more. And, and you know what, the best, the best one is the people, the diversity of the people the LGBTQ community, the Latinx community, the Black community, Southeast Asian community, you know, and on and on and on. Uh, you know, the, the millennials, the, the artists. I mean, the art, I mean, see my neighborhood? I love my neighborhood. I mean, I can switch from, you know, seeing an old timer, you know, I, I could speak Italian, I can go Tony Colonial, speak Italian, it reminds me of my grandmother, my grandfather, I go there, and then I can go sit on Broadway and we can talk about, you know, whatever, widgets. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, talking to, to Tom about the Columbus Theater, what should happen over there. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. You know what? And it keeps you, it keeps everyone interested. So it's here. Let's utilize it. We don't have to go out of state. We'll do it right here.
You're absolutely right. And I always like to tell people that I know from Ottawa down, it's, you, you may not know where we are, but we are a hidden gem. And just like, just geographically, we, we, we just have like, you know, the, the best of, you know, like the Amen. beaches going 30 minutes of being able to be on the other side of the state. It's just luxuries that, you know, as Rhode Islanders, it's something that we take for granted. Um, Representative Lombardi, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure to pleasure of mine to have you on. Well, I'm honored and privileged. And I, I'm really honored that you asked me. Now, let's do it again. And, you know, we, we get together in some kind of a forum. And maybe we can come up with some answers that uh, we can get some of the, uh, you know, the people in the state house, the, the, the big wigs to listen to us and say, look, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Here it is. Take the dust off. And let's do this. You know? <laughs> and you are always welcome to be a part of that. And you're always welcome back on just like anybody you, I, I've had on Pleasure the show. Mine. You have my number. You call me anytime. Absolutely. And thank you again for watching this episode of Reality TV. If you want to see future, future episodes as soon as they're posted on the channel, please click the subscribe button down below along with the post notification bell icon to the right of it. I'm Raymond Bakari. I'll see you on the next episode.